Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar today. We're delighted to have you here to talk about ChatGPT. My name is Sarah Noonan, I'm Marketing Director at Supercharge um, and I will be your host for today's session. So ChatGPT, where to start? This topic has consumed social and news feeds all over the world for the past few months. The main focus of these stories has been on the impact of businesses and people, both positive and negative. And that's exactly what we're going to discuss today with our experts. Um, so let me give you a short rundown of what you can expect from our event today. We have two parts. So first, you are going to hear from our supercharge experts, Ben Salukic, our experienced design lead, and David Kovac, our CTO, who will show some of the capabilities of ChatGPT through some exciting use cases. In the second part of our event today, we have a panel discussion, which will be led by Balaj Fonag, our chief strategist. I'll introduce the panel a little bit later on today, but buckle up. Um, we've got some great experts joining today with um, three very different perspectives, which will give us a lot of food for thought when it comes to generative AI. So today, we'd like to keep this session as interactive as possible. You'll have the opportunity to ask the panel questions via the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. And we'll also have a poll to get the audience sentiment and feelings towards ChatGPT a little later on. So we absolutely are encouraging audience participation. Um, and that's it for me for now. I'm going to pass you over to our CEO, Andres, for a short introduction. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for the intro. So hello, everyone. I'm Andres Tesseni. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Supercharge and Lend. I'd like to very warmly welcome all of you here today. Uh, hundreds of people actually registered for this event, which uh, shows how fascinatingly interesting uh, this technology is. Uh, and, um, and it's an honor uh, to have this event. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say just a few words about Supercharge, especially for those of you who haven't yet heard of us. So we are a digital innovation partner for companies across sectors. Uh, to realize their ambitions. Uh, we use digital strategy, uh, experience design, product, and data engineering to propel businesses forward. Uh, now, we see ourselves as a catalyst of innovation. Um, we, of course, have the important role of helping our um, clients adopt the latest in tech, but we also have this uh, kind of less formal uh, role as a fac facilitator for the broader professional community, which brings us here today. Um, now in early December, just a few days after um, ChatGPT uh, was released, we were pretty astonished to find that it's, it's solving our homework for recruiting engineers better than the average candidate. This of course prompted us uh, to go on and investigate uh, a broad range of use cases. And, uh, and th th that of course uh, confirmed our hunch uh, th that this technology along with other generative AI solutions, has some serious potential and it's worth having a conversation on. Uh, but of course, uh, the question remains, are we on the edge of the, the next big wave uh, that's going to disrupt our world? Or is it just uh, going to be a short-lived hype? Well, I won't have an answer for you. Uh, but what I do hope that what you are going to see and hear in the next hour will help you to answer this question for yourself. So with that, please welcome Ben Salukac, our experience design lead, who's going to show you the power of ChatGPT. Ben said the stage is yours. Yeah, thank you, Andres. So hi, everyone. OK, so let's start this webinar by exploring what uh, ChatGPT means for businesses. And let's see some, uh, some exciting uh, business use cases. So I'm, I'm sure you heard a lot about uh, ChatGPT already. Uh, probably you even uh, tried it and maybe you started using it in your uh, daily work. And you might have asked yourself questions like, is this just a temporary hype or is it real uh, opportunity for businesses? How it's gonna uh, transform your industry? And actually, how can, you, how can your company make use of it? So we will uh, try to help you find your answers uh, for these questions. So let's start at the basics. What is ChatGPT and why are we talking about it now? So ChatGPT is this large language model developed by OpenAI. It's, uh, it's optimized for conversations. It's available uh, as a chatbot and it was trained on almost 
all available uh, texts on the internet up until uh, late 2020 when its training was finished. So it's not aware of uh, very recent things. And it's not entirely new though. It's an improved version of GPT-3 that's been already available uh, for a couple of years. And I think uh, what creates the excitement around it is that it's significantly better than earlier versions and that it's available uh, now for everyone to, to try. So a lot of people could um, experience its capabilities. You know, a lot of us think of ChatGPT as a, as a chatbot because it's looked, it looks like a chatbot, but I think actually it's much more uh, and chatbot is just probably less than 1% of its use cases and what it's, uh, what it's capable of. And as the CEO of uh, an AI company called Aleph Alpha put it, large language models like ChatGPT can possibly solve every problem that can be expressed with language. So that sounds big, but what, what does it mean? It can generate text, entire documents, reports. Um, it can engage uh, in conversations and answer questions. It can uh, summarize text, analyze text, translate text. And it can also uh, write software code as uh, David, uh, my colleague, will uh, just show you and demonstrate you right after uh, me. And if you think about it, that covers a lot of the things that people to do today do in their work. And it also covers a lot of how uh, companies interact with their customers. So how good is ChatGPT and what are its uh, current limitations? Of course, it's very, very good, but it still has many flaws. I think that uh, suggest caution when thinking about uh, business uh, applications. Um, one of its main flow is that it often hallucinates, kind of makes up false facts, false information uh, that looks very convincing. And it's a little bit hard to predict when it's going to make uh, errors. And I think that makes it uh, unsuitable for um, very high stake use cases when only a few percent of errors can have uh, bad consequences. Like for example, using it for a medical diagnosis uh, without doctors, um, the doctor supervision. But I think we should also be fair with uh, ChatGPT because it's, it's a general model. It's, a, it's not yet specialized in everything all at once. And the key thing is that, is, is that you can uh, fine tune it. And just like when you uh, hire a new employee, you need, you need to onboard them on your on your processes, you need to teach that person uh, for, for the domain. The same way you can actually fine tune ChatGPT and customize ChatGPT for, um, for specific tasks. And actually data shows that uh, fine tuning and, and customizing ChatGPT will improve its accuracy on, on those tasks that it was uh, customized for. So that brings us to the next question. How can you actually use it uh, as a business? How can you approach it? And I think there's three ways to it. Of course, you can uh, use uh, ChatGPT via the chat interface as probably you're using it uh, now. And this way you can already uh, enhance your efficiency and your employees efficiency, and you can use it for a million things, but this way you only engage with this, uh, with this general pre-trained uh, pre model. Uh, you can also buy off-the-shelf products using uh, customized versions of GPT models, and I will show you a couple of examples for that. But I think really the best way, the most impactful way, is to integrate and fine-tune GPT to your businesses. It's going to be available via an API, just like uh, GPT-3 has today. And this way, you can really build AI capabilities uh, into your products and, uh, and services. So let's um, see some, some inspiring uh, business use cases and how it's going to transform a lot of industries. And I will start with kind of more firm use cases that already exist. And I will go towards more uh, future-oriented ones. So the first use case is, is uh, content creation writing, marketing, and sales copy. And there are already products like, uh, like Jasper.ai or copy.ai that use customized versions of GPT models to, um, to, to help copywriters write social media posts, website content, uh, product descriptions. And these tools don't replace uh, human copywriters yet, but really help to scale 
uh, their copywriting uh, activities. The second use case is product and market research. There's uh, a product called Viable, and it's using a fine-tuned version of, of GPT-3 to help product teams collect and uh, summarize customer feedback. And it goes through text from all kinds of sources, from uh, customer service chats, from course transcripts and social media reviews. And it classifies those, uh, those feedbacks and kind of turns them into a prioritized list of, uh, of feature improvements. And this way, it helps a lot product teams make good decisions on, on what features to, uh, to develop. The third example is an AI bot handling insurance claims. And this could be a, an example where GPT could be used to possibly automate an entire process that before uh, took a lot of slow and manual work. So imagine a fine-tuned version of, uh, of GPT-3 models that is, um, is fine-tuned on, uh, on the insurance company's policy could possibly assist customers in filing in the insurance claims, uploading the right documents like a police report or a medical report, and also go through these documents and process them and basically uh, even you know, make decisions on the case and this way handle the majority of the claims uh, almost uh, instantly. The third, uh, the fourth use case is uh, using GPT as an AI virtual therapist. And I think it's a little bit controversial use case. There's a, uh, a company called Coco and it recently published an experiment, uh, published the result of their experiment where they used a fine-tuned version of, of, of GPT-3 mm -hmm to provide emotional support for, for users via chat. And the AI bot was co-creating messages with, uh, with human professionals. And the interesting result was that users found uh, the messages created by this AI bot, Coco, more helpful than, than uh, messages created by purely uh, human operators. But when they learned that they were talking to an AI bot, that kind of ruined this uh, effect. And, really created this, um, this weird feeling around an AI bot simulating uh, empathy. So I think that's, that's a controversial use case, but it shows that GPT-3 and ChatGPT could be used in, in these more human-like conversational and emotional domains as well. Uh, the fifth use case uh, is a very exciting one. It's actually using ChatGPT in combination with other um, generative AIs like image generator AIs. Uh, to create uh, fully illustrated creative artworks. Uh, and ChatGPT alone is, is not capable of uh, generating images, only text, but you can use it to, to write storyboards or uh, generate ideas and concepts for artworks. And then you can uh, just copy paste its output and, and, and add it to image generator AIs like Midjourney or Dolly and create uh, create those artworks. And there's an experiment. I asked ChatGPT um, to, uh, to create a concept of an advertisement of a Land Rover for me, a billboard. And I copy pasted its output into Mid Journey and it generated uh, this image. And actually, the whole process took really less than a, a minute. And all I did was that I uh, gave this instruction uh, to ChatGPT and then I copy pasted its output. It even come up with this, um, this catchy tagline as well. So I think that really shows that uh, it's, it's going to transform how, uh, the, how people in the creative industry work. And, um, and it will be used to create advertisements or artworks for movies, books, uh, or video games. So these are just really a couple of examples for, for inspiration. And there are hundreds of more examples from all sorts of industries from uh, from healthcare to, to education. And I think it uh, ChatGPT really highlights two trends for businesses in the longer term. And one is that AI is getting quick, is getting better very quickly. And actually uh, it produces already feasible uh, business use cases and there are already products uh, out there that are uh, making business out uh, on it. And the second trend is that AI is getting easier to access. So companies don't need to invest in building their own uh, models and algorithms, but they can just use these 
large pre-trained foundation models like ChatGPT, and they can customize them and fine tune them for their own purposes. And that makes AI a lot cheaper also. So it's, it's like a service. And, uh, and these two things, trends create really good um, opportunities for businesses to adopt AI. So the final question is, should you start uh, working on it or should you wait until this technology gets uh, more mature? And actually our recommendation is that, yes, it's, uh, it's uh, worth to start exploring your use cases already. And even if you don't make an impact with it today, uh, it's wise to prepare um, for the coming changes uh, that it's going to bring. And uh, with that, that was uh, the end of my, uh, my section. Thank you very much. And, uh, and I pass it over to David Kovac, our CDO, who is going to uh, demonstrate to you how we use uh, ChatGPT in development. Thanks, Mansa. Hello, everyone. My name is David Kovac, and uh, I am the CTO and uh, co -founder, one of the co-founders of Supercharge. And uh, today, I would like to share my excitement with you about uh, ChatGPT and generative AIs in general, uh, because I think it will be a game, game changer on how we develop softwares and uh, how we create mobile and web applications. And as Benson mentioned before, ChatGPT is not only capable of uh, generating natural language, but it can also generate source code in uh, multiple programming languages. So today I came with a short uh, demo demonstration, a short demo uh, to showcase the capabilities of uh, ChatGPT. And as you might have noticed, ChatGPT is quite popular these days. So the service is uh, not entirely stable. Therefore, we pre-recorded uh, this demonstration part. So I will share my screen. Let's start the demonstration with a simple example. Let's ask ChatGPT to write a JavaScript code that can print Hello World. This is basically uh, the first task or first exercise every new developer uh, will bump into when learning new programming languages. And as you can see, ChatGPT generated console.log Hello World and we can just copy paste it into a browser console and run it. And as you can see, the execution ran and it printed out hello world. So the code uh, ran flawlessly. And this was a very simple example. A Google search would give the same answer. Uh, so there is nothing new in this, uh, but let's see another use case, another case study uh, where we can showcase the difference between ChatGPT and like a regular uh, Google search. So this uh, case study will be, will be played on uh, Twitch. I am not sure uh, if you are familiar with it or not. It's not necessarily to know it, but it's a streaming platform where streamers, content creators can earn hundreds of thousands of dollars if they have a large enough audience. And uh, sometimes they do post promotional codes into the chat part of Twitch. So here on the middle is the chat, on the left side there is the stream, and on the right side we have the uh, JavaScript console open. So they post promotional codes into the middle, and whoever gets these promotional codes first can redeem and earn uh, games or other prizes uh, based on these promotional codes. So usually you have to watch this continue, you watch the chat continuously and get these promotional codes, but let's ask ChatGPT uh, to help us be the fastest and continuously monitor the uh, chat for the new incoming promotional codes. So I copy pasted uh, this prompt into ChatGPT to create a JavaScript code that parses a chat on a Twitch TV site. And if user Nightbot, this is our um, sender of the message, writes to chat, the script should put the message into the clipboard. And as you can see, uh, ChatGPT generated the source code that finds the chat box on the Twitch TV side, then uh, subscribes to the new incoming messages uh, and extracts them, and then separates the sender, which is uh, the data username and the message part uh, from each other, and then puts that message into the clipboard. So if a promotional code comes, then it will be immediately 
uh, on our clipboard. So there is an interesting aspect of ChatGPT that if you write the same uh, prompt, it can generate different outputs. There is a uh, so-called randomness uh, in the outputs ChatGPT generates, which can be uh, very interesting and it can um, help you like figure out different solutions for the same problems. Uh, this gives ChatGPT some kind of a creative creativity. And in case ChatGPT will be available through APIs, then most probably this randomness uh, will be configurable so we can uh, control how much randomness we would like to get um, out of ChatGPT. And uh, another important note here is that ChatGPT does not connect to the internet, so it cannot know how the Twitch TV site looks like. So for example, these uh, query selectors that selects the chat box from the site are totally uh, random. Um, it just came up with these names like the chat messages and the data username and the message text. This looks good, but it's not the um, exact selector that we need to run. So um, I have to uh, I, I have to look look that up uh, from the Twitch TV site. So it generated as the source code. And there is another interesting uh, feature of ChatGPT is that we can, uh, we, we can specialize the generated code to our needs by asking new things about it. So now let's ask to add the debug message for every chat message uh, that is incoming and print if it is a match or not a match, a match with the, um, that the nightbot is the sender. So now as you can see, it extracts the variables uh, from the homepage or from the website uh, from for username and message text and then it logs it to the console so now we will be able to see it uh, when we run this code. So let's go back to the Twitch TV site and let's copy paste uh, the source code it generated and then we will be able to see if I start the stream and new incoming messages arrive, then we will be able to see uh, in the console log that a new message arrived. And as you can see, it, re it writes new message challenge from Doggy Live, and there's a new message uh, from Nightbot, and it also printed out uh, it's a match. So the funny thing is that the, the source code that ChatGPT generated is basically uh, flawless. It runs, it, it, it was a quite complex problem. It finds the chat box, it extracts out the messages, and then it matches if the username is the one we are looking for. So it can really be used for uh, real world use cases. But ChatGPT is not only capable of generating code, but it can also help us uh, learn new things about programming and uh, software development and we can ask just questions uh, about things how they work like how does the query selector work which was a function uh, in the previous example that it generated and then it desc describes the inner mechanisms of the query selector uh, it also it also gives us examples so basically it can act like a senior developer body for you and answer any questions that may uh, come up. Uh, you saw two use cases. One was the source code generation, and the other one was this uh, senior developer body who can help you learn uh, more about software development. But there are many other use cases, like you can uh, show a code snippet to ChatGPT and ask to find bugs, or you can use it for text research, so the possibilities are really endless. But um, we will still have to wait for a few weeks uh, for ChatGPT to be available as a stable service, but we can already use GitHub's Copilot, which was built on top of GPT-3, the previous version of uh, ChatGPT, already in production. As uh, there is a subscription service in uh, GitHub called Copilot, and then if you install it, you can integrate it into your development environment, like uh, Visual Studio Code, code or the JetBrains development environment, and then it can help you generate actually quite 
impressively uh, complex source code, or it can just uh, be used as an autocomplete tool. So that's something that's already available uh, for use for developers. And um, I didn't talk today anything about the constraints and limitations of ChatGPT, which there are a lot. So in order for you to be able to use it for creating mobile or web application for just generating source code, you have to be uh, you have to be aware of that and you have to know the constraints, how to use it. And also you have to have a, like a vague idea or like a high level idea of how the generated source code or the solution should look like so that you can ver verify that what it generated is correct and suitable, suitable for your needs. So that's why I don't think that ChatGPT will uh, replace developers uh, quite just now, but it can be a powerful tool uh, in a developer's hand if they know how to use it. So that was about that was from me, and uh, I would like to pass it back to Sarah. Super. Thank you, uh, David and Ben Saf for sharing those insights um, and taking us through those exciting use cases. As we just saw, it seems like ChatGPT has the potential to impact all of the areas of work from kind of business operations through to software development. So lots of things to consider there. Um, just to let everyone know, our poll is now open. So please get your votes in. We would love to get some um, idea from the audience um, as to where their sentiment lies and what their thoughts are uh, before we jump in now to our uh, panel discussion. But before we do that, I just wanted to quickly remind everyone to get your questions in. I can see a couple popping up there um, in using the Q&A functionality. Um, and while you get submitting your questions, let me just introduce you and give you a little bit of background to who we're gonna hear from. So we're delighted to have three experts joining us today who can shed light on the potential of AI from very, very different perspectives. The common factor between all three of them is that they work um, at the convergence of various branches of science so from biology to ethics and computer science. Um, and I believe, you know, in order to understand the potential impact of AI, that AI can have on the world of work, um, we need to ensure that experts have this rich perspective. Um, and these guys can serve as the bridge between human factors and these advancements in technology. So the panel we have today, we have Benjamin Giori, who is Director of Machine Assisted Modeling and Analysis at Harvard Medical School. We have Imra Vard, who is social researcher and trust and safety contractor at OpenAI. And finally, Olivia Gamblin, who is founder and CEO of Ethical Intelligence. Um, and before I pass you over to Balaj, who's our chief strategist, um, I wanna quickly check out the results to get a sense of, of where we're at. So actually an overwhelming 62% of people think it's a major development and we will actually see the impact within five years. So with that, Balash, over to you. Let's continue the discussion. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Sarah. And big thank you to our amazing guests for accepting our invitation and uh, spending some time with us today. Imra, Olivia, and Ben have uh, like really amazing insights into how AI can shape businesses and really our daily life. So I will keep my questions very brief to leave more time for them. And yeah, before that, just in a few words, I just wanted to say how excited I am about the newest developments in this field of generative AI. Uh, like uh, I've been working in the tech industry for a while and I rarely get this excited. And uh, really long since I haven't felt this thrilled about the new technology. I usually smile when I hear the word like game changer or something like that. And uh, even though I kind of wanted, I, I could never really buy into the, the blockchain craze. Uh, but after experiencing what GPT and chat GPT can do, I can totally see how transformative it can be. So with that, let's dive into the questions. And uh, first, uh, I think let's start with a little 101. Uh, we hear the expression generative AI a lot when people talk about chat GPT, mid journey or Delhi, or these things that came up uh, during the, the last year. Uh, and I, I'm turning to Ben. Uh, can you shed some light on what it really means and why is it now in the limelight? So what is this about generative AI that's so exciting? Uh, why does this branch of AI get this much press, this much public interest? Uh, what's so cool about it in general? 
Sure, thanks. So my name is Ben Jury, and I work on uh, biomedical research and use various AI technologies. And so generative AI is a type of artificial intelligence whose purpose is to generate new content based on some input, sometimes also called a prompt. And there are some models that are able to generate text. These are also called large language models, and other models can generate images or even videos. Um, and large language models are very large uh, artificial neural networks. The current biggest ones have on the order of hundreds of millions of learnable parameters. And they are trained on vast amounts of text uh, uh, scraped from the internet. So they do not require expensive labeled data to train. They can simply be trained on input of the type of content that they are meant to generate. Um, and so this means that with uh, enough data and large enough uh, number of parameters, these models are able to generate a very coherent and grammatically correct uh, uh, text in different languages. Um, and it's also interesting that even though these models are only trained on learning language, the content of what they generate is often useful and insightful. Um, so the models are quite versatile. You can use them to conduct a dialogue, to summarize text, uh, to translate across languages and different representation formats. And as we discussed earlier, to generate working snippets of software code as well. Um, and so uh, I suspect that some of the excitement for this technology comes from the fact that people can now directly interact with these models, both interactively on the web, like in the case of ChatGPT, but also increasingly application programming interfaces are made available that allow software level integration with uh, such models as services, allowing companies to build uh, products off of uh, the general, general models that are out there. Um, and so uh, in that sense, uh, it's likely that uh, these models will have an impact both uh, on our personal lives and the way we communicate and increasingly make their way into uh, various businesses, uh, both in industry and in sectors like education. Thank you, Ben. But that's very insightful. Uh, and I think it's great that we started with this bit broader exploration of the topic. Uh, because uh, obviously chat GPT is just one of the many AI systems uh, which, which will come up in this generative AI space. Uh, but we organized this event today, especially around chat GPT, because uh, I mean, uh, chat GPT is kind of the rock star of the field right now. It's, it's in a way topping the billboard chart uh, uh, for weeks uh, from December. And I think this was the one that made many in the tech industry realize that AIs have arrived to a whole new level. Definitely, it was the one that made me realize it. Uh, so with that, I, I turn to Imra, uh, who, who has uh, like a, a stronger connection to the to the chat GPT team. Uh, Imra, could you please summarize for us why this happened? Uh, why chat GPT became this kind of rock star icon right now in this field? And what makes chat GPT? uh special uh yes sure i can i can have a go at that so thanks everyone um thank you for the invitation it's really exciting to be here and to talk to you um i also want to introduce myself briefly so i wear two hats in this conversation on the one hand i'm a social researcher looking at the ethical and societal aspects of emerging technologies and ai and generative ai specifically and i also independently of that have a contractor role at open hit AI on the trust and safety team, but I must add that I'm not authorized to speak on behalf of OpenAI. So just to put that out there as a caveat. Uh, but to your question, the amount of attention that ChatGPT received over the past few months has really been staggering. And I think there may be two kind of broad reasons for that. I think the first is just the heightened level of anticipation that was really already palpable before its release. So OpenAI first put out GPT-3 which was already not the first large language model uh, in May 2020. And that already created a lot of attention and article headlines about how various jobs and industries and education are going to potentially get threatened by these new AIs that are competent in generating text. And since then, uh, kind of an ecosystem has been growing. Other companies have released language models. More and more developers started building applications once uh, GPT-3 became available as an API. Um, 
And so basically we have applications that sometimes have tens or hundreds of thousands of users in various industries. You mentioned in the introduction, like copywriting, for example, and, and computer coding assistant tools. These have really uh, grown significantly in the past two years. And then came Dolly in April last year, which caused like a huge splash. And it really brought this whole topic about human creativity and machine creativity and what these systems mean to a much broader audience, I think. So the release of ChatGPT last November happened in a context where there was already much heightened awareness of these tools and just enormous expectation and anticipation of what is going to come next. So like that's one thing, the landscape has matured a lot in two years. Uh, and the other thing is that ChatGPT in a way itself represents some improvements uh, over, over previous models. Um, it has a fine-tuned version of GPT 3.5, which finished training in early 2022. So its data is more up-to-date than previous models. Um, it, also, it also uses um, this kind of reinforcement learning from human feedback approach that OpenAI has been using for a while, uh, which is a way of just improving the quality of the generated text. This is where human labelers provide demonstrations of what a good response to a prompt would look like. Um, and then this information is used in various ways iteratively to, to refine the model and to, and to improve its outputs. And also ChatGPT is, is optimized for this conversational type interaction, and it has a very simple and intuitive interface that probably makes it easier for, for more people to use it uh, than previous versions. But as to whether the kind of hype is justified or not, I think it's best to focus on the trend. And the trend that we have seen over the last two years is that as models got bigger, uh, they generally became better, sometimes drastically better, acquiring qualitatively new capabilities uh, as they got bigger. So if that trend continues, then we may see some kind of deep, uh, deep transformations. But I'll stop there. Thank you very much. That, that was a very exciting deep dive. Yeah, I, I also feel that uh, the ease of interaction, the intuitiveness contributed a lot to uh, even people outside of the tech industry. Uh, trying this out and, and giving like unprecedented access to this this kind of technology so I think it has also a lot to do with that and indeed I find it very fascinating if uh, that how just simply the model size uh, can make the whole tech feel feel very different I, I'm looking forward to to see it advancing even further uh, with that I thought it would be great to see something different because I think Whenever we talk about generative AI, usually um, use cases like interacting with customers or using it creative fields like copywriting or marketing, these are the ones that pop into our mind. Uh, but it has also great potential to be extremely transformative in various other industries. Uh, I think a good example would, would be the medical field. And we are lucky enough to have here Ben, who is exactly focused uh, in doing research in that field uh, with AI. So. I would like to ask Ben to give us a little insight into uh, how generative AI will impact healthcare. Uh, sure, yeah. So uh, I, I want to separate in, in discussing this uh, different parts of uh, the cycle of discovery in biomedicine and finally the application of those discoveries in healthcare. In terms of the early stages of discovery, one of the key bottlenecks currently in biomedical research is the pace of publications, the pace of new findings that are being produced. It's about 4,000 new publications every day. And uh, in order to gain insight from these, um, uh, and, and more quickly get these to all the way to the clinic, one has to effectively interpret, summarize, and use these results. Um, and so one use of language models could be to better capture uh, uh, these new discoveries that are being published, and this might have an impact on early stage uh, drug discovery in finding new viable targets uh, uh, for therapeutics and so on. Now, on the clinical side, um, I can see uh, both doctor-facing or patient-facing usages of uh, large language models. And uh, generally speaking, these would be ones where uh, there's some kind of uh, interpretation need for complex text and, and, and the generation of text uh, on the other end. So examples of doctor-facing technologies could be uh, you know, drafting uh, uh, various uh, letters that doctors often have to write referrals to specialists where it's not just, a, not just a template, but it's something that has to be personalized to the given case of a patient and justify why uh, a referral to a specialist is needed. And drafting these kinds of documents and then editing them uh, could significantly accelerate this process and give doctors more time to 
to spend with a, a patient. Similarly, insurance claim justifications are very often uh, documents that have to be produced and could be accelerated through this process. Now, in terms of interpreting structured information, electronic health records uh, on, on patients um, are uh, uh, relatively uh, difficult to review qualitatively and summarizing that for doctors uh, to get a, to get an overview uh, could really cut down on the amount of time they spend scouring these documents. If patients fill out structured forms, uh, for instance, on some symptoms they have, then that, those again could be turned into summaries for doctors. As for patient-facing technologies, I think there's real potential in uh, turning complicated medical language filled with uh, uh, jargon that typical patients don't immediately understand into human com consumable materials. Um, and, and, and not just uh, not not just in ways that uh, that it's a one way uh, output from a system for a simplified text that the patient can understand, but the patient could even have a conversation with a medical report on their uh, MRI, for instance, and uh, and interpret that in the face of outside knowledge as well. So ask about a specific disease, ask about uh, various uh, implications, and so on. Um, and so uh, I, I also think that uh, uh, language models could uh, play a role in medical education where uh, they help uh, doctors uh, um, better communicate with patients and, and, and uh, uh, solve tasks more effectively in general. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, yeah, I think that's that's quite exci exciting. As whenever I think of AI and medical research, if I think of cancer research and uh, researching cells and DNA, all these kind of, of very complex uh, things and uh, and the the tasks and the the use cases that you mentioned are I think are much easier to comprehend for the average person and uh, for anyone who thinks in business processes. Uh, so I think it, it's quite exciting to see that AI will have a transformative uh, impact on these things as well when it comes to healthcare. Um, so let's let's just uh, uh, shift gears and and start to focus on on how this whole thing will impact society. As I mentioned previously, I say I think that experiencing what ChatGPT is capable of was kind of an aha moment for many people working in the tech industry. It was almost like an awakening. It made us realize that AI has just arrived to a whole new level. And I think I and I heard it from many uh, believe we'll start it will start to seriously transform how we live our daily life. Uh, replacing humans in the workplace, as Imra also mentioned, uh, seems to be one of the hottest topics. Um, and I thought we should look at the next three years, which is a relatively short time horizon, but potentially enough for some exciting developments. And I, I saw it from the the results of the poll that also our audience thinks that this. Okay, there we mentioned five years, but that means not something next year, but in the near future, uh, will really happen in this field. And how do we see the next three years playing out? Uh, and I'm turning first to Olivia. Uh, could you share your thoughts? What kind of broader societal changes can we expect as these next gen AI based products arrive to the market? Thanks, Buzz. And uh, I'm Olivia, because I guess we did introductions with each of us. Um, I'm the founder of Ethical Intelligence, but my background specifically is in AI ethics. So I am one of those AI ethicists that you see floating around the internet. Um, but that means that I am focusing on quite literally the Im impact and implications of our new and emerging technology, of which generative AI and especially chat GPT has been a huge topic, looking at what kind of societal impact is this going to bring. Um, now, I want to stress that the technology, it's fascinating. It's very, very cool. Um, but what I'm interested in is actually the use cases of it. Where is what's happening? What implications are going to come from the interaction between the technology and people and the users? So the technology itself, very cool. We're going to put that to the side. I'm not going to dig too much into that right now. But instead, I'm going to look at actually the use cases, because that's where the main social societal impact is going to come from. And quite honestly, we're at a fork in the road right now, and we can go one of two ways. Hopefully, hopefully uh, the path less traveled if we're going to go poetic here. Uh, but really, we're at, we're at a fork in the road in terms of what kind of impact we're going to see from this technology. What I mean by that is systems like ChatGPT or generative AI are offering us 
an opportunity to cognitively offload different types of tasks. So as you heard Ben saying, you can summarize different articles, you can um, run different lines of code, you can actually use it to help with some of your ideation. This is quite literally you're offloading some of the mental computation you need for different tasks. Um, we've done this before with technology in the past. The difference now is the scale at which we can actually offload uh, different mental capacities onto uh, generative AI systems. Why I say it's the fork in a road? Well, we as users are now in the driver's seat of how we're going to interact with this technology. We can go one direction where we just rely on it, where it's, you know, <laughs> as we've seen with some students, I'm going to have it write my essay, I'm going to have ChatGPT write my essay, or I'm going to have ChatGPT help me crack this code, or I'm going to have ChatGPT write this article for me because I don't feel like doing it. Um, in that case, what you're doing, it, it, what we're seeing users do is just completely offload all of their uh, mental computation or their, their cognitive load onto the system. That's like, okay, I'm done. Um, that, in in my honest opinion, you're you're cheating yourself in some some ways. That that way, you know, the tool, it, it's it's a tool, and it can be a fantastic tool to help you with ideation, to help you summarize mass amounts of information for then you as the person, the user, to actually interact with and use um, and take it a step further. But if you only stop at what the system is giving back to you, then you have effectively. Um, cheated yourself because you can actually push it further. So in terms of that societal impact, we are at a fork in a road where user where I'm intrigued to see whether users take the road of, I am going to completely offload all of my mental uh, capacities onto these types of systems, in which case we'll see a lot of um, copy paste style uh, answers out there, or if we'll actually use it as a tool as it's designed to do to grow off of and to uh, push our thinking further. Um, back to you, Les. Yeah, thank you very much. In, indeed, uh, that's very exciting if, if people uh, will use it to kind of finally realize the original promise of industrial revolution, not to do any work and let the machines do it, or will we use it uh, to work the same much, just smarter and more effectively. Uh, Imre, what is your take on this? How do you think this will impact our life? Yes, I, I have to say that I actually agree on a lot of the points that Olivia mentioned. I'm, I'm kind of very much in agreement on that. I think the stakes are high. Um, as you know, like predicting, making predictions is hard. There is this saying, and especially hard about the future. So I'm very cautious here. Um, but I would, again, maybe look at this from the perspective of some trends. And one such trend, as I think was already mentioned during the intro presentation, is towards like more and more natural ways of interacting with machines, where we can just tell them what we would like in plain language, and then they do it. Um, and probably this will expand to more areas in the, in the near future. Already today, you know, we can give plain language instruction to these systems, and they generate text or create they create an image. Uh, but there are companies that are working on using the same principles to the generation of video, sound, music, 3D models, um, all sorts of things will be added. Uh, one company demonstrated a model, transformer-based model, that could browse the web, uh, gather information, uh, synthesize that in various ways, uh, use familiar tools like Excel and, and Photoshop based on very high-level instructions. So it can follow these high-level instructions without the human necessarily knowing even how to accomplish that. They just need to know what they would like to have accomplished. And then the system is, is kind of uh, autonomously capable of doing that, which means that the human skill of being able to perform certain tasks might get devalued and become less in demand, which might really question a lot of the way in which we, uh, we train and educate people um, today. And I very much agree with the point that Olivia mentioned around cognitive offloading. I think we will see more and more complex cognitive tasks getting outsourced and offloaded uh, to machines where they're increasingly used as and capable assistance, which is something that a lot of people are talking about nowadays, and it has been a vision for, I guess, human computer interaction for a long time, but it seems to be becoming uh, ever more, ever more real with, with these releases. So I think that the, the value of genuine human contribution, whatever it is that machines cannot do, uh, is likely to become more important. So we have to rethink, uh, as I said, what we consider to be the purpose of education, and also how we distribute the benefits um, of these tools. Uh, because we already know that uh, big technology companies have an enormous societal influence and societal power. 
And in a sense, this technology can further increase that centralization if only a handful of corporations um, end up in a position where they essentially offer these intelligence uh, services uh, to others. But I expect that we'll continue to be surprised as new models get released, as it was mentioned, with scale capabilities, new capabilities emerge. Um, and maybe besides scale and cognitive offloading, another one that I would really want to highlight quickly is the issue of truth and like shared living, living in a shared reality, which is something that is already an issue and is really under threat and is challenged by uh, social media companies and, and other developments. But we should really think about what it means that the cost of generating high quality content in various media, be that text, image, video, sound, digital humans, essentially approaches zero. It becomes virtually free to produce that kind of content. So we might find ourselves in a very strange world where we can't tell whether something is human-made or machine-made or some kind of hybrid. And I think this will result in a kind of arms race between generating synthetic media on the one hand and being able to detect uh, synthetic media on the other, which is something that the US uh, Defense Agency is, is already looking, uh, looking into heavily. Um, which foregrounds the problem of the proliferation of disinformation and, and misinformation, uh, which are issues we already see, but they might get drastically exacerbated uh, in the near future. And those are kind of the known problems. And then there are unknown problems around how these tools will change values and, and moral norms in society. Yeah, that's uh, almost, uh, almost freaky to think about these things. And uh... Uh, this this cognitive offloading uh, is, I think, a very exciting topic. I was uh, really thinking about will that lead to some kind of, uh, in a way, cognitive atrophy, like uh, we stop thinking in certain ways, we stop exercising a part of our brain. I, I experienced this uh, with navigation, that I, I never navigate myself anymore. I let a mobile phone tell me exactly where to turn. And as a result, I find myself actually totally unable to navigate when uh, when I lose my phone, when I don't have internet connection. So I wonder if same, similar things will happen to certain more creative tests than, than navigation. Uh, we are running out of time uh, and we would like to leave a little space for the Q&A. So I would like to introduce a like, quick round of rapid fire questions. Uh, I would pose the very same question. What will be the biggest impact in the next three years on companies and businesses? And first, uh, I would like to ask this from Ben and then Olivia, and please, both of you, try to answer in a rap rapid fire manner, just in one minute, your most important thoughts. So, how companies will be affected? Yes, yeah, so I thought. I think the initial demonstration showed many good examples that I agree with on how these technologies can be used immediately. So, what I one thing that I would highlight is that I think that currently uh, the right way to use these technologies is in a kind of employee in the loop way where uh, you can accelerate the creation of different types of content, but then edit it and review it before releasing it to manage liabilities, rather than thinking about full automation or replacement uh, um, uh, uh, for, for these uh, technologies. So that's, I think, uh, the right way to think about it, whether it comes to customer service, marketing, software development, and so on. Thank you, Olivia. Could you also share your thoughts, please? Yes. Um, so I believe right now, with, especially with um, technology like or systems like Chat GPT, we're not going to see uh, direct impact on business at least for the next year or so until the system is reliable. Um, companies don't have reliable access to it, uh, but also it's not reliable enough in terms of its answers and and, it, and uh, the information that it's giving back. So like Ben was saying, keeping that employee in the loop, um, I do see it in terms of a marketing direction. There are ideas around um, something called like endless content, uh, which is essentially just constant content coming out and out and out and out. And if you have a generative system like this, you can quite literally always be producing some type of content. Um, I see that as the main use case for companies. Uh, it's less it's less risky to write a blog post than it is to uh, have a line of code that if you, if you don't know if it's um, going to break a system or not. Um, so I, from my, from my perspective, we're not going to see direct um, changes to business in terms of significantly shifting how we how we run our, our companies and our business models um, until the systems are much more reliable. Um, 
as well as once these companies come out with a business model around uh, the generative uh, AI, such as chat GPT, we, we don't have a business model currently, um, minus the subscription model, which has come under immediate scrutiny. So we'll see if that even ends up being a viable business model in the end. Thank you. And I think let's let's use that to segue, uh, segue into the uh, Q&A. So I think, Olivia, please stay on. This one will be for you. Uh, anyway, I wanted to maybe run out of time, but I wanted to ask you about uh, uh, a bit of the ethical side of the equation. And this, this uh, question from one of our viewers is exactly about that. So what are your thoughts on uh, privacy concerns uh, with businesses using sensitive data with open AI solutions? So like solutions coming from open AI, I think of uh, policy, client data, uh, like when, when you uh, share this data uh, with an open AI provided AI system, how do you see this question? Just don't do it right now, please. Any private information, any sensitive information, do not share with in, with uh, any type of general, generative AI model yet. We, we don't know the security around it well enough. Um, we don't know how that's being interacted. You know, a lot of the information that these systems were built off of, and, and I, again, I'm sure uh, Emmer could speak better to this um, around the instances of ChatGPT. Um, these systems are fed on information that is open and available to the public. You should not be incorporating any type of private information into this. That information is fed into the system, and that system in the system is trained on that private information. Um, unless you have direct consent to integrate that, that to use that information, to use that data, do not use it, just don't touch it. Um, we're not sure yet what those implications are going to be. And frankly, that's just a violation of privacy to people that are trusting you with, their, with your information. Um, so for right now, you don't need to do it, don't do it, leave it. Thank you, that was a, that was a very concrete and actionable answer. Uh, we have time for one last question from the audience. Uh, Imre, uh, this one is for you. Uh, I will read it up. What are your views regarding regulating these technologies? Are governments uh, as up to speed as they should be? And there are a few uh, topics that the question touches on, job redundancy, layoffs, uh, AI taxation, universal basic income. I think this is a very loaded question. So I think just focus on the first part. Are well, governments and, up to yeah. speed in terms of regulation when it comes to AI? What do you think? Uh, I think in, I think increasingly it's it's a it's a topic that is very actively investigated, actually in all major jurisdictions that uh, contribute to AI. So definitely in the U.S., in Europe, and also in China. Um, whether governments are up to you know up to the task of regulating that i don't think i'm in a good enough position to judge that i think it's it's necessary it's important and i think uh, regulations are definitely emerging uh in in all relevant jurisdictions so um and on the point of universal basic income i mean that's that's also something that ai companies themselves um are are actively thinking about for example like open ai is also thinking about um how to best distribute the benefits uh, of these ai systems as broadly as possible you can read about that in the kind of mission statement of open ai um so i think i'll just yeah. stop there yeah that's kind of reassuring that the companies at the forefront of this actually even consider these questions as something that should would, be solved. I wouldn't say forefront, but it's actively being considered by governments, rightly so, and by companies as well. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we, we run out of time, so I will hand it back to Sarah, please. Uh, and I, I thank you very much for our guests uh, for, for joining us. Uh, this was an amazing conversation. Super. Thanks so much, Balash, and thank you to the panel um, for that lively discussion. Lots of key takeaways there for our audience. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of our speakers and panelists for taking part. This wraps up our session today. Um, for the questions we didn't get to, which there were a couple, um, we will be following up with, with all of those afterwards, and we'll also be sharing the recording um, with everyone um, after the event. And for those of you who are interested in continuing this conversation, we will also be providing a discovery workshop where you can work with our team um, to access um, 
sorry, to learn how um, you, your business can better leverage ChatGPT. Um, so more on that later. Um, and finally, I would like to say a massive thank you to all of our viewers for joining us today from all over the world. I hope you enjoyed the session um, and you found it useful and we hope to see you on our next event soon. Thank you and have a great rest of your day.